Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you all for being here. I am joined by Benita Gupta, head of the Civil Rights Division here at the Department of Justice. We are here to announce a significant law enforcement action regarding North Carolina's Public Facilities Privacy and Security Act, also known as House Bill 2. Now, the North Carolina General Assembly passed House Bill 2 in special session on March 23rd of this year. The bill sought to strike down an anti-discrimination provision in a recently passed Charlotte, North Carolina ordinance, as well as to require transgender people in public agencies to use the bathrooms consistent with their sex as noted at birth, rather than the bathrooms that fit their gender identity. The bill was signed into law that same day. And in so doing, the legislature and the governor placed North Carolina in direct opposition to federal laws prohibiting discrimination on the basis of sex and gender identity. More to the point, they created state-sponsored discrimination against transgender individuals who simply seek to engage in the most private of functions in a place of safety and security, a right taken for granted by most of us. Last week, our Civil Rights Division notified state officials in North Carolina that House Bill 2 violates federal civil rights laws. We asked that they certify by the end of the day today that they would not comply with or implement House Bill 2's restriction on restroom access. An extension was requested by North Carolina and was under active consideration. But instead of replying to our offer or providing a certification, this morning, the state of North Carolina and its governor chose to respond by suing the Department of Justice. As a result of their decisions, we are now moving forward. Today, we are filing a federal civil rights lawsuit against the state of North Carolina, Governor Pat McCrory, the North Carolina Department of Public Safety, and the University of North Carolina. We are seeking a court order declaring HB2's restroom restriction impermissibly discriminatory, as well as a statewide bar on its enforcement. Now, while the lawsuit currently seeks declaratory relief, I want to note that we retain the option of curtailing federal funding to the North Carolina Department of Public Safety and the University of North Carolina as this case proceeds. But this action is about a great deal more than bathrooms. This is about the dignity and the respect that we accord our fellow citizens and the laws that we as a people and as a country have enacted to protect them, indeed to protect all of us. And it's about the founding ideals that have led this country, haltingly but inexorably, in the direction of fairness, inclusion, and equality for all Americans. This is not the first time that we have seen discriminatory responses to historic moments of progress for our nation. We saw it in the Jim Crow laws that followed the Emancipation Proclamation. We saw it in the fierce and widespread resistance to Brown v. Board of Education. And we saw it in the proliferation of state bans on same-sex unions that were intended to stifle any hope that gay and lesbian Americans might one day be afforded the right to marry. And that right, of course, is now recognized as a guarantee embedded in our Constitution. And in the wake of that historic triumph, we have seen bill after bill and state after state taking aim at the LGBT community. Now, some of these responses reflect a recognizably human fear of the unknown and a discomfort with the uncertainty of change. But this is not a time to act out of fear. This is a time to summon our national virtues of inclusivity, of diversity, of compassion and open-mindedness. And what we must not do, what we must never do, is turn on our neighbors, our family members, our fellow Americans for something that they cannot control and deny what makes them human. And this is why none of us can stand by when a state enters the business of legislating identity and insists that a person pretend to be something or someone that they are not, or invents a problem that does not exist as a pretext for discrimination and harassment. And let me speak now directly to the people of the great state, the beautiful state, my home state of North Carolina. You have been told that this law protects vulnerable populations from harm, but that is just not the case. Instead, what this law does is inflict further indignity on a population that has already suffered far more than its fair share. 
This law provides no benefit to society, and all it does is harm innocent Americans. And instead of turning away from our neighbors, our friends, and our colleagues, let us instead learn from our history and avoid repeating the mistakes of our past. And let us reflect on the obvious but often neglected lesson that state-sanctioned discrimination never looks good and never works in hindsight. It was not so very long ago that states, including North Carolina, had other signs above restrooms, water fountains, and on public accommodations, keeping people out based on a distinction without a difference. We've moved beyond those dark days, but not without a tremendous amount of pain and suffering and an ongoing fight to keep moving forward. Let us write a different story this time. Let us not act out of fear and misunderstanding, but out of the values of inclusion and diversity and regard for all that make our country great. Now let me also speak directly to the transgender community itself. Some of you have lived freely for decades, and others of you are still wondering how you can possibly live the lives that you were born to, live, to lead. But no matter how isolated, no matter how afraid, and no matter how alone you may feel today, know this, that the Department of Justice and indeed the entire Obama administration want you to know that we see you, we stand with you, and we will do everything we can to protect you going forward. And please know that history is on your side. This country was founded on the promise of equal rights for all. And we have always managed to move closer to that ideal, little by little, day by day. And it may not be easy, but we will get there together. Let me also thank my colleagues in the Civil Rights Division, who have devoted many hours to this case so far, and who will devote many more to seeing it through. And at this time, I will turn the podium over to Vanita Gupta, whose determined leadership on this and so many other issues has been essential to the Justice Department's work. Vanita. Thank you, Attorney General Lynch, for those very powerful words. Throughout the arc of our country's history, from tragedies of injustice to marches for equality, there have been pivotal moments when America's leaders chose to stand up and speak out to safeguard the ideal of equal justice under law. And history will record your inspiring words and our forceful action today as one of those moments. I also want to take a moment to thank the entire team throughout the Civil Rights Division and the Department of Justice who have worked tirelessly over the last several weeks to ensure that everyone in North Carolina has the full protections of our laws. Today we filed a federal civil rights complaint in federal court in the Middle District of North Carolina. Before I discuss the details of our legal argument, I want to make one thing clear. Calling HB2 a bathroom bell trivializes what this is really about. HB2 translates into discrimination in the real world. The complaint that we filed today speaks to public employees who feel afraid and stigmatized on the job. It speaks to students who feel like their campus treats them differently because of who they are. It speaks to sports fans who fo feel forced to choose between their gender identity and their identity as a Tar Heel. And it speaks to all of us who have, made, who have ever been made to feel inferior, like somehow we just don't belong in our community or like we don't fit in. Let me reassure every transgender individual right here in America that you belong just as you are, that you are supported, and that you are protected. Our complaint brings legal claims uh, under three different civil rights statutes. Two of these statutes are long-standing protections against discrimination in the employment and education context. Title VII of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and Title IX of the Education Amendments of 1972. It is fitting that these statutes, which emerged from our nation's long struggle to banish a legacy of legal discrimination, are now being used to defend, to uphold, and to affirm the progress that resulted from that struggle. Progress that represents America at its best, at its brightest, and at its strongest. Title IX and Title VII prohibit discrimination based on sex. The Department of Justice has for some time now made clear that sex discrimination includes discrimination against transgender people. That is discrimination based on gender identity. That is consistent not only with the language of the statutes but also with the legal interpretation adopted by federal courts, including the appellate court with the jurisdiction over the state of North Carolina. There is nothing radical 
or even particularly unusual about the notion that the word sex includes the concept of gender. Transgender people are discriminated against because their gender identity does not match the sex that, they, that was assigned to them at birth. HB2 denies transgender people something that all non-transgender people enjoy and take for granted, access to restrooms consistent with their gender identity. That's sex discrimination, plain and simple. This view is confirmed uh, when proponents of measures like HB2 misinterpret or make up facts about gender identity. Here are the facts. Transgender men are men. They live, work, and study as men. Transgender women are women. They live, work, and study as women. Our Title VII claim is brought against the state of North Carolina, the North Carolina Department of Public Safety, and the University of North Carolina because of discrimination, sex discrimination in employment. Our Title IX claim is brought against the University of North Carolina because of sex discrimination in its educational programs. We also bring a claim under the Violence Against Women Act, VAWA, a more recent statute specifically designed to prevent discrimination against transgender people by entities that accept certain federal funds. As with Title IX, entities that accept federal funds under VAWA, including UNC and the North Carolina Department of Public Safety, uh, pledge that they would not discriminate on the basis of sex or gender identity. Our complaint seeks to enforce that pledge and hold those entities accountable for discrimination, for the kind of discrimination that is required by HB2. Now, even as we seek that compliance, we remain committed to working with any agency receiving federal funding to develop a plan to ensure their compliance with federal law. And for the reasons that I just highlighted, HB2 violates the law. But HB2 also threatens the values that define us as a people, and these values are timeless. These values say to all people that you can be who you are and that you deserve to live with dignity. The complaint filed today seeks to enforce these laws and protect these values. And at this time, I will uh, pass the mic to the Attorney General, who is available for questions. Thank you. Thank you, Julia. Yes, I don't know whose hand was first. I'm just going to go right to the middle and then out to the sides, as I usually do. Yes. Thank you. As you pointed out, Charlotte what, um, passed this law that would have allowed transgender people to choose a bathroom based on how they identified. But there are many municipalities who have not passed laws that specifically allow for that. Is the Justice Department thinking of intervening in places that have not passed laws like that? And would you consider intervening in other places that have done what North Carolina has done um, if you see a pattern that evolves? Well, let me speak to just the last part of your question first with respect to jurisdictions that may have passed or are considering laws similar to HB2. To the extent that we're made aware of them and we know that there are a few out there, we are monitoring and reviewing those situations as well. Now, let me also be clear. We remain open to discussions with any jurisdiction that has questions about whether or not a particular ordinance is going to fall afoul of federal law. With respect to the Charlotte Ordinance, the Charlotte Ordinance essentially added to its anti-discrimination language, language making it clear that it also afforded protections for those uh, who are dealing with issues of sexual orientation and gender identity. HB2, in its discussion saying that you cannot have that as part of your non-discrimination laws, moved to strike that down. Uh, we would encourage jurisdictions to be as inclusive and as open as possible in their anti-discrimination coverage. Uh, you said you retain a right to curtail federal funding. What is the threshold for that? At what point will you go after North Carolina's federal funding? Well, with respect to federal funding, the, the statutes that we have uh, brought this lawsuit under do provide the opportunity to curtail federal funding either under Title, seven, under, title sorry, under Title IX and under the Violence Against Women Act. But as I've said, we remain open to discussions with the state. In fact, we know that the university system has reached out to us. Their Board of Governors is meeting tomorrow. We remain anxious to see what those discussions will bring. And so we are deferring on requesting the curtailment of funding now, but we do retain that right. It'd be premature right now to give a date on when we will actually take that step. Okay. Madam Attorney General, today the governor said that the Justice Department is bullying and engaging in overreach. What about that? Well, I think that the people who feel bullied are probably the transgender individuals who live in the state of North Carolina, who live and work beside their neighbors uh, without any problems and have done so for years and are now being singled out on something that they have no control over and is as an essential part of who they are. So I would shift the issue of bullying uh, to considerations along that front. 
Uh, certainly the state of North Carolina has been aware that we have been reviewing and monitoring this law for some time. We have, as I've noted, been in communication with the university system uh, for several weeks now. Uh, so they have been aware of this as well. And as I noted in my remarks, an extension was requested and was under active consideration. Attorney, Attorney General, uh, Mississippi has, filed, has uh, passed a law that uh, allows people to not provide services if they disagree with uh, same-sex marriage, for instance. Uh, where does the Justice Department fall on, on this issue? What, does, it, does it fall into civil rights law uh, like this one does? Well, to the extent that uh, states or any jurisdictions may pass laws that allow businesses or anyone else to discriminate, we will always review those laws and see if there is, in fact, a basis for federal review and intervention. As I said, we remain open to talking to jurisdictions who, who are concerned about this, and where we see laws that are on the books now, we are actively reviewing and monitoring those. But I'm not able to comment right now on action that we may or may not take. Let me just come to this side. Yeah, thank you. It's a separate topic. Uh, the election calendar is well advanced. Is it too late to take legal action in the Clinton email investigation? Well, that investigation, as you know, is an ongoing matter. It's being handled by the career lawyers and agents of the department, and they will review all the facts and evidence and make a recommendation at the appropriate time. So I don't have anything more to say on that particular matter. The reason I'm, the reason I'm asking, please, is because you've moved very quickly on the North Carolina matter. And the average American is wondering why it's taking so long to reach some kind of conclusion on the email investigation. Well, as I indicated, we do all of our uh, reviews, investigations of any matter carefully, thoroughly, and efficiently. And when the matter is ready for resolution, a recommendation will be made, and we'll come to a decision at that time. And I'm not able to give you a prediction. Sorry. One other thing the government recording mentioned today is he suggested that perhaps Congress should actually lend some clarity, get involved in the debate, and perhaps... Um, amend existing discrimination laws or, or clarify uh, the intent and the meaning. I'm wondering, do you think there is room to sort of specify additional protected classes to remove any ambiguity that might exist? Our lawsuit makes clear that it's our position that federal law has been clear for some time now that discrimination against sex includes discrimination against individuals based on sexual identity and gender identity. The law is clear, the cases are clear, and the Fourth Circuit recently made it clear, frankly, only about two weeks ago. So I don't have any further comment on the governor's view or understanding of that law. I would also note that the Violence Against Women Act specifically talks about gender identity. Uh, so we feel that the law, the regulations, and the case law around Title VII, Title IX, and the Violence Against Women Act clearly indicate that HB2 is in violation of federal law. On another matter, of the last 48 hours, there has been a lot of talk out of Mexico that the extradition of Joaquin and Chapo Guzman is imminent. Um, could you give us a timing on that? Is, is there any confirmation on that? And is the U.S. concerned with the fact that he was uh, taken to a different prison, uh, one that, according to some reports, is not as secure as the one where he was at before? Well, with respect to the extradition of uh, El Chapo Guzman, that is a matter that is being handled by the Mexican government uh, and the Mexican Attorney General's office and their court system. We've provided them the information that they need to make those determinations, and we're looking forward to an imminent resolution of that. But because it is being handled by that jurisdiction, I'm not able to give you a timeline or a prediction on when it will actually occur. So I'm sorry for that. being transferred to a different prison? Again, his conditions of confinement in Mexico are under their control, and so I'm not able to give you a comment on that as well. So I'm sorry about that. Let me come to this side and then sir. Um, the lawsuit that you filed refers to both uh, bathroom and changing facilities. Can you explain why you don't see a distinction between the two? Because some people have said, well, they could understand why a state might want to limit changing facilities because people are sometimes completely naked in those facilities, whereas not as commonly so in bathrooms. Um, why do you not see any valid distinction between those two categories? Well, HB2 doesn't distinguish um, amongst them, and so to the extent that the law requires state agencies to treat state employees and students differently based upon gender, in those areas, uh, it's in violation of the law. Now, there are any number of ways to accommodate privacy interests uh, in a bathroom or in a changing area, as long as they are equally available to all students and all employees. You cannot single out any one particular group uh, of people uh, to be treated differently. And if I could just follow up on that, doesn't the law also ban all types of LGBT uh, discrimination provisions across the state? 
I don't see that mentioned in the lawsuit. Uh, is there anything the Justice Department might do about that aspect of the law? Well, this lawsuit today focuses on the federal statutes that we've mentioned. As you, as you may know, there are other lawsuits that are currently pending that we feel will be moving forward at the same time as well all of which recognize that HB2 is, has set in place state sanctioned discrimination and we support those actions as well. And, and then. Attorney General Lynch, were you surprised today by the actions of the governor in your home state? And does the Department of Justice plan to appeal in another lawsuit the Department of Justice has brought in North Carolina, the voting rights lawsuit? Well, well with respect to the voting rights uh, lawsuit, we actually have filed a notice of appeal as of this past Friday in that suit. As I've indicated several times from this podium and in other places, we will continue to vigorously enforce every individual's right to vote and keep that right free and open uh, for everyone. So that notice of appeal was filed this past Friday in the North Carolina case. And with respect to the governor's action, um, you know, again, I don't have any comment on that. As I indicated before, we were engaged in discussions with them about the timing of a response uh, in the hope that we could work with them on ameliorating this law in some way. Obviously, whether it, how it will be literally handled is always up to the state legislature. We were certainly hopeful that we could have those discussions with them. I think it's unfortunate that the governor's actions this morning curtailed that. Uh, but having, having made that choice, we are now moving forward. Madam Attorney General, um, given it's a political season and this is a touchy subject for some, uh, have, it, did you consult with the White House about any of this uh, uh, over the last week? We'd make our enforcement actions separately and independently, and certainly I think the White House is aware of, of, the, of the law and the issues, and they've had their own comments on this, uh, but we have made this decision based upon uh, what we feel is the appropriate move to make at this time. You, you, you just referred to expecting an imminent resolution. You just referred to expecting an imminent resolution of the Guzman case out of, out of Mexico. So does that mean that his transfer here is imminent? Do you believe that's going to be happening? With him? What we're waiting for is a final order from the Mexican court that would that would finally order the extradition. Uh, we are waiting that. We are hopeful that we will attain that. And as I said before, we are working with Mexican authorities to make sure that we have provided all the information they need to make that determination. Once that order is entered, and again, we are hoping for it, but again, it is up to the Mexican court system, we will then be in contact with them about the mechanics of a transfer, and that has not begun to occur as of yet. Last question. I have a follow-up to his, and then my question. A follow-up to that, when he, if, if he is extradited, how do you determine which of his cases, where he'll be prosecuted? Because as we understand it, you've submitted two extradition packets, but there's about seven cases pending. What are the factors that you look at when deciding who will prosecute him? Well, we look at all of the relevant charges against an, any individual who's brought here via extradition and determine what uh, particular jurisdiction can, often by working with another one, uh, generate a case that covers most of the relevant conduct, if not all the relevant conduct, and will provide uh, the best remedy for his actions. And so every case is considered. We often combine cases. Uh, there is a process of review that undergoes, that, that, that's undergone here in the department. And then my question was, in terms of your ongoing litigation with Apple, in two separate cases, you very aggressively went after Apple, used the courts to try to compel them to assist you in criminal investigations. And in both of those cases, the Department of Justice and the FBI eventually backed off. In one instance, you were able to find another way to get into the phone. And another, in another case, as would be expected, the defendant was willing to offer his password right ahead of sentencing. Do you wish, looking back, that you might have handled those cases differently? No. <laughs> As we said at the time, when we, went, we made those motions, we had exhausted all opportunities, but we always continue to obtain and to seek to obtain information. And if we are fortunate enough to move forward, we take advantage of that. And we undertake our, we, we live up to our uh, obligations and responsibilities and notify the other party that assistance is no longer needed. Uh, but the short answer to your question is no. All right. Thank you all. Thank you.